नमस्ते उजरम्मा जी वेलकम वेलकम टू आर हिमसा कॉन्वर्सेशन सलाम जी जी वालेकुम सलाम तो व्हाट इज योर व्हाट इज नॉन वायलेंस मीन टू यू अहिंसा का आपके लिए क्या मायने है फॉर मी वेदर इट्स पर्सनल और वेदर इट्स इन सोसाइटी फॉर मी नॉन वायलेंस इज हार्मनी एट ईच स्टेज एंड यू नो बिटवीन स्मॉल इन स्मॉल इंसिडेंट्स और इन लार्जर सोसाइटी so like in the family in the household uh but mainly what i have been working on is a uh, a kind of industrial harmony so that everybody has a share in what is happening there should not be a question of employers versus employees or uh it should, so it should all industry should be in the hands of the producers democracy in other words economic democracy Emo- economic democracy Ji. so democratization of production and ideally speaking even the customers should be in touch with the producers and uh, they should know uh, who where it comes from where the product comes from and why they do what they do and of course fair payments on all sides the customer should pay a fair price and should get a good product for that price so um if it's okay with you i will just tell you how uh it started yes. and uh how it's going on and finally end up with you know what we are actually working on now my dream has always been harmony in society which actually fits in nicely with your a uh, non violence idea but uh, the question is how to go about it how to take the intermediate steps it's all very well to have a vision but you also need to think about how it's going to happen and what are the small steps because each step you know if it's not an individual thing where you can decide how fast you will go or how slow you will go it involves a lot of other people sure so uh, you have to take small steps and you have to take other people with you so one of my cardinal uh, principles was never to do anything on my own that i would always you know wait for other people to join me so that i don't get left you hear all the time of you know people of my age you know older people who have started out brilliant uh, uh, organizations or brilliant initiatives and then you know you find that they're uh, sitting there at uh, age when they want to retire the age they want to retire but they can't actually hand it over to anybody because you know by that time the idea is already full fledged and i feel that the thing to do is to uh, induct more people into your idea at the idea formation stage so that they also feel that it is their idea so that's been the principle on which i have worked so i have been fortunate to have always younger people who have been participants in my idea so i thought i always thought that handloom weaving was a good place to be because uh, first of all as you know it is the largest industry uh, in india it has been for thousands of years uh, india was the cotton cloth supplier to the world and uh, we grow our own cotton we make our own yarn and we, so we have been self sufficient in cotton making and cotton and we have always exported cotton for thousands of years and so uh, that for me was a good place to begin but uh, even though it is such a large industry it has always had a sort of well not always but um, uh, i suppose for the first for the last 2 uh, or 300 years the structure of the industry has been very feudal yes and uh, because i've also been doing historical research into this uh, industry i find that there were different ways in which cloth was made one was a way in which ordinary cloth was made by ordinary people for ordinary people 
and we were able to export, for example, there's the uh, uh, diggings, the archaeological findings at a place called Fostat, which is now a suburb of Cairo, but it used to be a separate village. And they have found there uh, Indian cloth dating from uh, the 9th to the 14th centuries, 500 years of export of ordinary cloth. Or uspe jo chapa hai, wo kapde pe, wo bhi mota mota chapa hai. It's not fine quality printing. So this is not for the elite. This is for ordinary people. Now, all over the world, people did make cloth for themselves, which was born at home. But there was a big difference between what they made at home and what they made for export. So India's uh, great contribution, I feel, was to make ordinary cloth uh, exportable. So it was uh, cheap enough to give a good living to the producers. And it was, uh, of course, cotton cloth has always been wanted everywhere. But ordinary people in places like Egypt and uh, even the empire of Rome, they were able to afford it. Yeah. And we exported so much cloth as uh, I'm sure you're aware that the first century Roman historian Pliny complained that India was draining Rome of her gold. Yeah. And one of the major exports was always cotton cloth. Right. Uh, Uzrama, can I just pause you for a second? You made a very fascinating point that India's cotton cloth production turned somewhat feudal only in the last 200, 300 years. So can you tell us a, in a bit more detail that why what we did for thousands of years till the arrival of British colonialism was not feudal and why it was uh, a much, uh, it was almost a non-violent economics. Can you just describe that please, before we come to- I feel it was a completely non-violent economics. Uh, what happened was that the British introduced uh, machines into various stages of cotton making. They introduced machines on the field to separate the uh, seeds from the lint. Uh, of course, they introduced spinning machines and weaving machines, but that came later. But with the introduction of machinery, uh, more capital was needed for the machines. Otherwise, it was always a very low capital thing. Everybody could afford that small spinning wheel and uh, could buy the cotton. We had the local markets and the cotton farmers used to come to the uh, markets with their cotton and the ordinary weavers used to be able to buy that cotton and to be able to spin it at home and so on. But with the introduction of big machinery, you needed uh, capital for that. That's right. And so when you needed capital, then you needed an intermediary who would provide that capital. So there was the role of what we now know as the master weaver, who was That's the intermediary between the market and the producer. And uh, there was always a small niche market which supplied the elite in India, uh, which used uh, you know, gold zari, silver zari, and fine yarn. But that was a very small part. I mean, when you consider the population of India and the uh, proportion of the elite was always tiny. But what happened with the introduction of machinery was that uh, this kind of need for capital became sort of took over the entire industry. And it uh, made the actual weaver into just a laborer on right. the machinery. So in a, what I'm hearing you say is that it deprived the entire production ecosystem of its sense of agency. Am I correct? Uh, that every, I suppose, many yes, players, yes, did, suppose. everybody had a greater sense of agency in the earlier system. Yeah, when you say agency, I mean, what I'm hearing from when you say use that phrase, sense of agency. Yes. Manava, sense of empowerment. The yeah, the, the democratic principle. Yes. So, uh, the, with the small and the markets were a, was a very important thing. So there used to be this small weekly markets, where uh, which was dominated by small producers. Uh, we have an account uh, in some old uh, British papers around 1867, I think it is, of this weekly market in a place called Jamur Ghatta, which is you know near Varda, 
And uh, in that market, large numbers of ordinary weavers came and they brought their, they brought their cloth to the market, which they sold. And they also uh, resupplied themselves with yarn and with uh, the spinners resupplied themselves with the uh, raw cotton. So all these uh, lateral relationships yeah. were made easy by these small local markets. It's a very interconnected thing. You know, you can't separate production from market yeah. and the cost and you know, all those things. At this point, uh, I would request you to explain to us uh, in what ways uh, the Industrial Revolution itself, firstly, and then piggyback riding on the... So I really want to separate, in a sense, the Industrial Revolution violence from colonialism, just for argument's sake for a moment, because I think today it is very difficult for many people to grasp uh, because we've all been educated to glorify the Industrial Revolution as the savior of the species. Uh, but can you, your sector, your story of cotton and handloom weaving really demonstrates in what ways it in introduced unprecedented forms of violence. So can you explain that first from the technology aspect? You know, for example, the story you tell about why a particular kind of cotton came to be chosen. Because the 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 plant was decided to suit the machine. So, so what was this story of uh, greater violence? So, you know, the first machines of the Industrial Revolution had to do with cotton. They were yarn spinning machines. And uh, everybody knows that, you know, the spinning jenny and the mule, they were the first uh, machines that were made to spin yarn and later on to weave cloth. Spinning was much earlier. And uh, so the yarn that they spun, India, you see, you cannot disconnect the industrial revolution and colonialism as far as I'm concerned, my thinking is concerned. Because uh, India provided the market for that yarn. So once uh, the uh, machine started making yarn, it was on a huge scale. Whereas, you know, in India before that, we've always had small scale on uh, the, there'd be a huge number of small scale. So it will all add up to the large scale, but it will not be the similar, exactly the same thing. Not the very, it's very different. The scale, even though it is large, it is very different from that machine, which produces the same kind of uh, yarn. So where would this machine spun yarn be exported to? It was to its biggest colony. So India was considered the biggest customer of the products of the Industrial Revolution. So that's why I feel you can't separate the two. So they started. No, they, no go ahead, please. They so they started. started sending yarn to India. And you know that lovely, that pathetic letter which Gandhi reproduces in Young India from the. Uh, uh, Spinner who used to support her aged in laws and daughters on her spinning is not able to do it any longer because the yarn which is uh, now brought into the market is sold cheaper than her yarn. Yes, yes. But the, re the reason I was suggesting, just for our uh, purposes of understanding, that we look at the Industrial Revolution and colonialism uh, distinctly for a moment was. What you have told me in the past many times about how the uh, spinning jinny, because the machine came to be, for whatever reason, designed in a certain way, the cultivation of cotton was molded to suit the machine, not the other way around. Yeah. So that yeah. story, so that... if you can tell, and how, because that was a crucial element of the economic and cultural violence that was then inflicted on India. Yeah. So uh, the... Uh, spinning machines. I think you're mixing up ginning and spinning. I'm sorry. Please, but, Claire, please make my... <laughs> I, I, I stand correct. Yeah, yeah. So ginning is removing the seed from the lint. And uh, then uh, spinning is, of course, using that lint to make yarn. So when that machine was introduced, 
basically it needed a certain kind of lint, which our cottons were not suited for. First of all, our middle name is diversity. Everything we do, our great strength is diversity. And the minute we start getting away from diversity, then we get into trouble. So we had very flexible uh, tools. You can call them machines if you like, like the uh, charkha and the uh, charkha or the takli. There were two different ways of spinning. Charkha was introduced about the 13th century, Irfan Habib says. But uh, even before that, the takli. So they were able to spin different kinds of cotton. But once the machine was introduced, it needed only one kind of cotton. And that cotton had to suit that machinery. So basically what uh, the spinning machinery that is in use today is basically on the same principle. And because it's made of metal, our tools were mostly made of wood, which didn't, wood doesn't generate heat when you uh, use it. But uh, metal, gen metal, especially when it becomes faster and faster, generates more and more heat. So then you need a raw material that will able to withstand that heat and uh, which will not break with the speed of that spinning. So ours was slow speed and non-heat generating and the machinery that were introduced was generated heat and uh, needed longer and longer staple to withstand the speed. And basically what is in use today is on the same principle. Nothing has changed as far as the principle is concerned. And the so-called you know, advanced or modernized machinery only just make it faster and faster. Yeah. And so more productivity. And the productivity is at the cost of the farmer. You, we of course all know of the farmer's suicides and most of the farmers who commit suicides are actually cotton farmers. And the reason they commit suicide, I mean, why are farmers committing suicide when they've been growing cotton for thousands, literally thousands of years with no trouble, is that they have to produce a kind of, a kind of fiber which is not suited to Indian farming systems because our farming has to depend on the weather and Indian weather is known to be unreliable. One year it rains too much, one year it doesn't rain enough. And the desi cottons had long tap roots, which were able to withstand a bit too much of rain and a bit too little rain also. Whereas the American cottons, which were introduced for the sake of the machine, have much shallower roots. So they're much more likely to give up entirely if there's a flood or a drought. Yeah. So, so go it's ahead. a complex Sorry. issue. Yeah. 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 No. So, is it fair to say then that our uh, indigenous economic systems were nonviolent or at least not actively violent because the human being and human social structures were given primacy and the machine existed in order to serve us? Whereas the Industrial Revolution, though it seems to create machines that serve us, actually it flipped the order. Am I correct? Absolutely, absolutely correct, Rajni. You see, it was all, all the spinning and the weaving was very closely integrated into the social systems. And uh, because we have diversity of social systems, you know, the people from the Northeast, for example, do things in a very different way from the people in the South. Yeah. And everybody in each area, they developed their own cottons and they developed their own way. Every area produced cloth. Yeah. In every area of India, you find weaving, but you find different kinds of looms and you find different kinds of cotton, which is grown there. The Northeast, the people in the Northeast now say that we never had our own cottons, but that's not right. They've forgotten their history. There were local cottons that grew in the Northeast. And uh, there were, of course, different cottons everywhere. Now, the government, unfortunately, doesn't realize the value of this diversity. And they also try and squeeze everything into that uh, mass production mode, which doesn't suit us at all. 
Yeah. So they will try and introduce, for example, the try to introduce long staple cotton. So there was a cotton called Suvin, which was introduced, I think, about 25 to 30 years ago. Yeah. But after some time, it's lost its characteristics. Yeah. So you can't introduce things artificially. They have to be organic. They have to be organically uh, part of uh, a system, an ecosystem. Right. That includes the people and the tools and everyone. And, and that, in a sense, uh, is precisely what you have worked for, I think, for over yes. decades now. So can you uh, give a brief overview of that journey from Dastakar Andhra to decentralized spinning to Malka? Well, um, as you step into any kind of activity, you find the complications and all the complexes in that industry. So you can't know everything straight away and you're not born with that knowledge. But uh, when you get into handloom weaving, then you see how the connections with the cotton, you see the connections with the technology. For instance, when we started our first handloom weaving project, we started in a small village called Chinnur. And uh, the government in its wisdom, we were supported by the government, which was a government funded project. So they funded frame looms only. So now the frame loom, the difference between the frame loom and the hand loom, they're both hand weaving, but the frame loom take, can take a much longer walk. So uh, allegedly the productivity is higher, but in Chinur, the weavers have been used to weaving on pit looms. Now, when they had to weave on the frame loom, they were able to make these long warps. So each a warp was about 220 meters or something. And whereas a pit loom takes a meter of about 12, uh, uh, takes a, a warp of about 12 meters. So in the village in Chinur, and see, we learned all this that we've learned, we learned from practical experience. So uh, in Chinur, when we started uh, the weaving project, People heard that weaving has started again in Chinur and they're very happy. And they would come to the weaver's house and order a uh, head cloth or a lungi. And, uh, but the weaver had to say that, well, I have to finish what is on the beam first. And uh, then only then I can make what you want. And just at that time, the power loom was also introduced. So the, uh, the market had these ready-made a power loom cloth. So instead of waiting for the weaver to finish his long warp, the uh, buyer was able to go to the market and uh, buy a power loom cloth instead. And so when you see the difference between the hand loom, the pitch loom and the frame loom, you have to also see what is the market for which it is uh, uh, being used. And for a village market, for a small market, a pit loom is much more suitable. Yeah, yeah. So what this is all illustrating, Uzrama, is, uh, you know, Gandhiji's uh, very famous observation that uh, it, the, the answer to the, our, uh, you know, species really, not just to India, is not in mass production, but production by the masses. Uh, so can you uh, say how your decentralized cotton project tried to make an intervention in that regard and, you know, promote that. Well, the first the thing that we did uh, was to make the uh, scale of spinning smaller because what happened when the uh, spinning machines came in is that the scale of spinning became much larger than either cotton growing or of cotton weaving. So both these small scale occupations were then dependent on a much larger intermediate so the first thing that we did uh, was to reduce the scale of spinning. So we made these small scale spinning units, which are still running by the way. But what we have not been able to do so far, but what we are going to work on now is to also uh, change the technology because though our units, the Malka units are smaller in scale, but they still use the same principle of the technology. We have not yet changed that principle of the technology. So um, I don't know how much time we have because uh, oh, we have I can time. go on. 
No, no, please, please don't hesitate. We, I have all the time in the world. Okay. Go ahead. Go so, ahead, please. Uh, so these are the small steps we've been taking towards that self-sufficiency, that democracy in production, and you know what you would say the non-violence uh, in production to reintegrate the whole business of making cotton cloth back into society as it used to be, into local uh, 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 communities and the capabilities of local pe people. Spinning and weaving are actually very simple things. If you're given uh, those hand tools, anybody can learn to weave in a couple of days and they can learn to spin in no time, five minutes, I suppose. And uh, so uh, jumping ahead to the uh, project that we're working on now is to integrate the cotton farming uh, with the spinning and the weaving. So we've got a, a meeting planned in the next few weeks between the farmers of one area where the, there, are, there is also local weaving. And we want the farmers to come and look at the spinning because see, normally what happens is once the farmer sells the cotton, it goes out of his hand and he really has no idea what happens to it. So we have suggested to the local farmers that they come and look at the spinning and uh, uh, at the weaving. So they're going to do that. So we're organizing this big meeting where uh, we will suggest it to the farmers. And eventually we want the farmers to not only look at the spinning and the weaving, but to be so closely integrated with the spinners and the weavers who are all local. And eventually to be able to buy the cloth from the cotton which they have grown and to be able to wear their, uh, the product from the cotton which they grow. So then by, that, uh, by doing that, then we will have integrated the entire textile, cotton textile chain. Excellent. And uh, I'm uh, very fortunate that, you know, I've been able to work with uh, younger people and to hand things on to younger people who can, you know, carry it on for many years. Yeah. And many of those younger people, if I know correctly, are, uh, you know, IIT engineers and, you know, people who actually have trained in the modern industrial systems, but are taking a great interest in this work. Am I right? Uh, not entirely. My young colleague, Anapuna is now the anthropologist at the Deutsches Museum in Germany. Uh, but uh, And she did train as an electrical engineer. I forget that, uh, as an was, IT engineer. And Kannan, yeah. I was thinking of Kannan. Yeah, but we are no longer associated with the machines that Kannan uh, designed for us. Okay. But that was a stage we went through when we were very closely associated with Kannan, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, Susrama, what I've always found fascinating is that uh, at a, even today, many people uh, would dismiss uh, handlooms or at least would treat them even if they don't dismiss them. Many people may give importance to handlooms, but see them as something which is a relic of the past. You have always argued that cotton production and cotton uh, cloth making are the uh, quintessential industry of the future and that you have always seen it in more futuristic terms because uh, it checks for uh, correct you know it gets all the right ticks on any criteria of sustainability that we would apply today so can you uh, you know just briefly explain that uh, and i think your example of the footprint of cotton from the field to the cloth i'm wearing uh, we know is dramatically reduced in your method. So can you explain why that happens? Well, um, you know, India is now the biggest exporter of cotton in the world. We've overtaken raw, China. You mean raw cotton? Overtaken the US. Raw cotton. Hmm. But uh, this is something that, again, I don't understand why. You see, in the government, the Ministry of Agriculture is separate from the Ministry of Textiles. So, uh, they don't see that there's any connection. So they export what should be our raw material is exported and they're very pleased, the Ministry of uh, uh, Agriculture is very pleased at the high levels of uh, export of cotton. But uh, if you look at it in a different way, this is the raw material that we should be growing for our own industry. And uh, today the world is looking at uh, 
everything sustainable and what they call green. And what the government should be saying to the world is look, we have the biggest sustainable cotton cloth industry in the world. And uh, the government should be promoting it as that. Yeah. But unfortunately, our government is always followed in the colonial footsteps. You know, the brown sahibs have always, you know, taken the white sahibs route. They followed that route and they still think that mass production is a, a good thing for us. Now, whether it's a Congress government or a BJP government, they all seem to follow that rule. They don't look at, I mean, uh, we hear the people saying, the government saying that uh, village industry should be encouraged, but what is the actual way in which they plan to encourage it? I, I have really have no idea. And you cannot uh, keep handloom weaving uh, restricted to the elite because the elite markets, whether it's in India or whether it's abroad, is always going to be small. But the, there is a huge number of people who value cotton cloth and they always did and they always will. So why are we not promoting our sustainable cotton cloth industry, the handloom industry, as a sustainable industry for the future? Yeah. So uh, just to enumerate, one is that it is very low uh, uh, energy in terms of either uh, whether it is uh, uh, carbon energy or even renewable energy. Uh, uh, if, if we were to grow cotton in the native way and do this process in the way that you have uh, innovated, or at least you have brought up to date for, not innovated, but made it relevant for the contemporary uh, situation. So it's low energy, it involves masses of people, it is an easily uh, deployable skill, it gives the individual uh, manu you know, producer or worker a sense of command over their time and their energy and their work location, right? And it then is also uh, very amenable to a decentralized use. So it's a decentralized production and it's a decentralized use of the product. Am I correct? And have, you know, have I missed any points? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. And uh, somehow we're always looking to catch up with China. You know, we always feel that China is ahead of us. But this is an industry in which we totally outcompete China. Nobody can beat us for, uh, you know, producing cotton handloom cloth. Nobody in the world. We have the, uh, always been in historical times and we can be today again, the uh, leading uh, producers of sustainable cotton cloth. Something, by the way, which China would be very happy to do. You know, when we had this um, uh, conference to which uh, the Chinese people came, they wanted to learn from us about, you know, how to grow indigo, how to do natural dyeing, and uh, uh, also envied us for our large cotton weaving industry. Why are they not able to do it? What do we have that they don't have? Um, first of all, we have the tradition of making cotton cloth on the hand loom. Now, uh, some time, what China is good at, you see, what China does, which uh, we have never done, is work to its strengths. You know, China, the, the Chinese people are largely one racial type. They're the Han people. And uh, everybody else is, you know, much, much smaller, maybe... 10% of people are non-Han, but they're all one racial. That's again, a great difference between India and China. India is made up of a lot of different racial types. And- uh, How does other, that have a bearing on the production system? No, so, if, yeah, so the thing is that they, what they're good at is, is making a lot of the same kind of thing because they, are, they think in the same kind of way. You see, whereas our strength is diversity, it always has been. And that is what actually China envies us for is our diversity. But you don't get it, you know, in a day. We have uh, all kinds of diversities and we should understand that diversity is our strength. Here, would you like to uh, say something about uh, the 
issue of varna and varnashram and jati because i i feel that the modernist mind tends to look at the question of varna ashram and jati in a somewhat one dimensional way whereas the story that you have always told of both the history and the contemporary reality of uh, cotton uh, production uh, and uh, weaving etc indicates that we had a very complex and overlapping structure of social relations uh, would you like to comment on that at all or share any detail well, that as you see as as far as i know in my information the largest part of the indian population is the uh, working population you know uh, the people who are the intellectuals and the people who are the warriors have been always very small parts of the population the largest part of the population of india has been the working population the farmers the hand workers you know the people who metal workers you know any kind of artisans and farmers they have been maybe i don't know a huge percentage i don't think anybody has actually done that kind of census and in that working population there's a lot of flexibility the gold weaver the gold the goldsmith can become a wood worker and so on there's a lot of uh, flexibility and whatever happens to be uh, the thing in demand at that moment they turn their hands to like a lot of the artisans in the anza region for example who were uh, uh, spinners or weavers have now become agricultural labor because that is the uh, economic activity that is paying proper wages and if we were able to introduce if we were able to have uh, you know uh, good wages for any kind of artisan work you know they would they can come back to artisan work in a minute so there's a lot of flexibility and they one can turn uh, their hands to another how do you then see the current uh, dominant trends in technology because uh, we are living in a time when um, the results the outcomes of artificial intelligence are uh, well shall we say like uh, ready to take over the world it would seem and uh, every day one hears uh, news of some new ways in which technology is going to be embedded in our lives right up to chips that are going to go into people's brain you know that will give them an advantage apparently in many ways so as somebody who has been so deeply concerned about the issue of structural violence and technology and economic systems how are you feeling about this how see it that is one way of progress certainly but nothing replaces personal relations i think you've seen this in the covid thing you know the things that people really suffered from was loneliness and what whatever brilliant chip you have in your mind you still need the touch and feel of another person because we are a sociable creature human kind is a sociable creature so i don't feel uh afraid in that sense that we're going to lose that because that's a very integral part of our human characteristics it's only when we all become martians or you know give up our humanness that uh, we will change and once we, if we do that then we're another uh, species and i don't know what we do with that mm. but as far as the human species goes uh, you know they uh, need sociability it's built into the human structure what advice would you give in closing uh, what advice would you give to young people who want to be part of the ongoing effort or and, and especially now with climate chaos uh, becoming uh, more and more accelerated uh, there are a lot of young people i meet who want to be part of the solution they i can sense in them a striving for you know the nonviolent systems in the way you have described them so what are some of the 
you know tips or what is firstly what are the inner strengths that they can cultivate to strengthen their own resolve and what are some of the pathways that you see which are in could be inviting for them see there are a lot of well intentioned young people i think the people who come and talk to you for example are very warm hearted and very well intentioned and uh, I, there are people i know who uh, for instance uh, when from andhra pradesh uh, there was this horrible exodus of the people who didn't have work you know who walked back to their villages so i know people who spent their time and their own money in feeding those people they set up kitchens and fed them so all these people who come to you the young people who come to you i think they are looking for some meaning in their life and uh, what uh, see there are people like uh, asim shrivastava and so on uh, ashoka foundation so he is running these courses exactly for people like that and uh, i feel that they have to spend time in those organizations and if there isn't one nearby they should do some research into the kind of organizations that would help them to fulfill that and you see it's not enough just to have those good intentions and work on these things it's you also need a revolution you need a kind of social revolution that would make those you know i don't know if you are familiar with the bakasura story Yeah. but no, yes but i would like you to yeah. narrate it again here so the uh, bakasura is this monster that comes to uh, the jungle and every day he demands a sacrifice of uh, two of a uh, particular animal so today it will be one particular animal and tomorrow it will be some uh, other particular and the animals are all fighting among themselves as to who will be that uh, sacrifice obviously nobody wants to be but uh, the fight amongst themselves is who is going to be the first to be sacrificed then a uh, little rabbit comes on and when it's his turn to go he makes that bakasura look into a well and so the bakasura uh, sees his own reflection and he jumps into the well and that is the end of the but so the point that that story makes is not uh, to see who is going to be the first sacrifice or who is trying to remain and be the last sacrifice but to get rid of the monster and in my opinion it is the commercial system it is capitalism which is the actual monster and however much these lovely lovely young people uh, who spend their time feeding the uh, people who need food you know who fed the workers who are mo uh, moving back home they need to take a step further and realize that what is it that's actually causing those things what is it that made those people all go back to their villages why isn't there work for them in the villages why did they come in the first place and so why are they not working on that kind of social revolution that will ensure that those things never happen again rather than you know just spending their uh, you know using their warm hearts and their good intentions just to uh, take care of the uh, people going back or the people in trouble do you feel that in society at large people to people level uh, that both physical and verbal violence is increasing and if so how yes, there's... go ahead but there's no there's no doubt about it that uh, violence is increasing but uh, there is a system it's like that bakasura story it's like the system pits one against the other you know everything becomes a race india is pitted against china the rich are pitted against the poor the uh, you know so there's uh, uh, always somebody or something against which you are pitted when nobody so then people give up the idea of working together and so that's what that's where the violence starts and it starts in the household it starts between individuals it's not just only at the high level and it just grows and because you get used to the idea that you have to be constantly fighting for your rights or even for your survival or even for your survival yeah and at the same time i think it's a parallel process that in a very systematic way um, ideologically non violence is depicted as cowardice it is um, 
uh, uh, it's uh, running away from something. Yes, it is equated with, uh, well, not being strong enough to fight back. Do you want to say anything well, about I think, that? Well, I think uh, Gandhi put that idea to rest because he said that's the best way is to, is to fight violence is with nonviolence. It's not just running away from the violence. It's not being passive. You have, it has to be a very active thing. Any closing thoughts? Anything that we left out? Which no, thank you very much. No, but yeah, anything chance, else yeah. on your mind? Not really. You, Of course, I would like to talk more in detail about the work that we're doing because this is actually the small steps you know, that need to be taken. And uh, our group is a very practical group. So I think you have to think more about you know, what are the steps to be taken towards a non-violent society.